after a long cold winter, when the sun begins to warm the air and flowers start to bloom, America's pastime awakens from its slumber. Throughout spring, the crack of the bat and the snapping of gloves echo around ballparks everywhere. And deep into those dog days of summer, when teams are running down the stretch and a fan favorite steps up to the plate, three letters can be heard shouted from the stands. One sports game franchise has been dormant for over a decade, a series that had many different names, but it's known by those three significant letters. What happened to this series that was seemingly in its prime, and why is it still gone today? This is the legend of MVP Baseball. Chapter 1. The Birth of Baseball Games Although its origins are murky, baseball has been around since the 1800s. Considered by most to be America's pastime, it's the game of baseball that has brought together young and old. A game that is enjoyed as much by people 50 and older as it is by those young enough to still actively play the game. Because of this support, Baseball has spawned thousands of games for people of all abilities to play at home. From the advanced video games of today, to the strategic board games of the past. In the 1940s, a retired ball player by the name of Ethan Allen invented a board game called All-Star Baseball, in which players were to use a spinner to determine the outcomes of each at bat. Although primitive, the game was popular among baseball fans, opening the door to what was possible with the idea of baseball in the comfort of your living room. In the 1950s, a young man by the name of Hal Richmond decided that he could do much better with representing the strategy of baseball and developed a game that would use playing cards levied against player ratings to gain more accurate outcomes of each at bat. Richmond would develop this game over the years, ditching the playing cards and giving each player their own card complete with stats, ratings, and a slew of possible outcomes that would also take the pitcher's skills into consideration. Stratomatic baseball would dominate the market for the next few decades, even as other competitors came along with similar ideas. Richmond and his small company soon caught the attention of the Major League Baseball Players Union, who sought to take a piece of Stratomatic's earnings for themselves in exchange for using the names of players on the cards. But against the odds, Stratomatic and Hal Richmond are still going strong today, even offering a computer version of the game. But the Players Union wasn't the only blow to Hal's revolutionary product. As the technology was still in its infancy, most work on computers were done at colleges. Mainframe computers were used to make the earliest video games. These games were often shared over networks between different colleges. In the early 70s, a student at Pomona College in California by the name of Don Daglo created the very first interactive computer baseball game. Simply called Baseball, the game allowed you to manage a single game between two teams. While nothing special by today's standards, this baseball game, programmed for the PDP-10 mainframe computer, was the birth of what we have today. But Daglo's connection to what would eventually become the MVP Baseball series goes even further. As computers and eventually video game consoles made their way into homes, Daglo was hired by Mattel to program and develop video games. One of Daglo's first projects for Mattel was the highly influential Utopia, which is seen as the first godlike game ever made. After the success of Utopia, and with his history of creating the first interactive baseball computer game, Mattel put Daglo in charge of creating a baseball title for the Intellivision home console. How come all you ever talk about our sports games? Sorry? Programmed by Don Daglo and Eddie Dombrower, Intellivision World Series Major League Baseball was released in 1983. Unfortunately, this was the same year that the video game industry experienced a devastating crash due to oversaturation and low quality of games being released. Around that time, a game company by the name of Electronic Arts was flourishing. EA, led by industry visionary Trip Hawkins, 
struck it big early with their sports title, One on One Dr. J vs. Larry Bird. EA saw big money in developing sports games, and they weren't the only ones. As the gaming industry recovered from the big crash of 83, Nintendo's NES console found a way to portray itself more as a toy and less as a video game console. Everyone from Atari to Jalico to even Nintendo themselves were producing simple, action-based baseball games for the booming NES. EA decided it was time for them to get in on baseball as well. With the success of Dr. J vs. Larry Bird, EA went looking for a legitimate name they could attach to their new baseball enterprise. And going along the same lines as the company did for John Madden Football, Electronic Arts contacted then Orioles manager Earl Weaver. Weaver, who some credit with being one of the earliest managers to use Moneyball tactics, never actually played in the major leagues. Earl went from the minors to a managerial position with the Knoxville Smokies in 1956. Weaver then went on to manage the Baltimore Orioles for nearly two decades and was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1996, having led the Orioles to a World Series win over the Cincinnati Reds in 1970. With Weaver's unique philosophies on how the game should be played, he was a prime cover man for EA's first baseball game. Of course, EA needed to find the right programmers for the job, so they teamed with the father of baseball video games himself, Don Daglow, along with Eddie Dombrower, to create their game. Much like EA did with getting as much input from John Madden as they could for their football title, Daglow and Dombrower got together with Weaver as much as possible to get his view on baseball strategy and situational aspects of the real game. Weaver was reportedly not only fine with the frequent meetings, he was more than happy to do so, as he never really left his hotel while on the road anyway. Discussing baseball was always okay with Earl. Chapter 2 the rise of console sports games. EA's experiment with Earl Weaver Baseball was well received, and even spawned a sequel, also released for PC platforms. After the console market crash of 83, PC and Mac were seen as not only the safer platform to invest in, but could also allow the programmers to stretch their ambitions a little further. However, with the boom of the NES and with technology growing at a rapid pace, it was becoming more and more clear that the home console market had legs. If a kid doesn't play Nintendo, is he a square? No. He's a wuss. <laughs> Sports were a popular choice of game to produce for publishers, as many had been making them for over a decade now. Games like Tech Mobile and Punch Out, which became all time NES classics, had been born in the arcades. After all, sports were just real life athletic games at their base. At one point in time, baseball was the most popular sport in the United States. While football has handedly overtaken baseball as America's game these days, football's worldwide popularity isn't quite the same as it is in the US. In Japan, baseball is the nation's top sport, and when it came to making baseball games for the Famicom, the Japanese name for the NES, there were plenty to be found. Some of these games were ported to the NES, with the Japanese ports, the arcade ports, and the first-time efforts all combined, baseball games flooded the home console market. The range and quality of these games were vast, with some being barely playable to others spawning franchises that are still produced to this day. EA knew it was time to transition their sports games to home consoles, but also knew that the NES and Sega Master System were too crude for their ambitions. But in 1989, Sega released their 16-bit Genesis console, opening a new door for home console games. EA wasted no time in aligning itself with Sega's new machine, and by the time they released their first baseball game on the Genesis, EA had already supplied the user base with a dozen other sports games, from John Madden and Bill Walsh football, to Lakers vs. Celtics and Bulls vs. Blazers, to FIFA and NHL. EA had begun to establish themselves as the go-to publisher of sports video games, even branding a separate division of their company as EA Sports, and creating the popular catchphrase, EA Sports, it's in the game. 
that first baseball game for EA on the Genesis stayed in line with securing a manager's name for the title. Tony La Russa, then the manager of the Oakland Athletics Ball Club, was not far removed from three straight trips to the World Series, winning just one of those series in 1989 against the San Francisco Giants in what was dubbed the Bay Bridge Series. Unlike Earl Weaver, La Russa played in the major leagues with the A's, Braves, and Cubs before becoming the manager of the White Sox in 1979. Tony La Russa Baseball was released in 1991 on PC, before EA commissioned to adapt it in 1993 to the Sega Genesis. The PC version was developed by Beyond Software, a development company founded by Don Daglow, and published by Strategic Simulations Incorporated. The Genesis game, while a bit rough in the gameplay department, was praised for its realism. Daglow and his team took what they had learned from Weaver and combined it with the knowledge of Tony La Russa. La Russa spent several years with the team, going over how the AI should act in many different situations. The game didn't have the MLB license, scrubbing any and all team logos from player uniforms and caps. EA did secure the MLBPA license, though which ensured that most players you saw on the field in real life were also in the game. While EA was just getting warmed up, another video game giant decided to jump back in the baseball market, and they came equipped with the biggest baseball star of the early 90s. Nintendo, whose main headquarters are located in Kyoto, Japan, decided to move their North American HQ from New York City to Seattle, Washington in the 80s to be geographically closer to their home country. Due to the way Nintendo thrived in their new U.S. home of Seattle, Nintendo's then-president decided it was time to show their appreciation for the port city by buying a 49% interest in the city's Major League Baseball team, the Seattle Mariners. The Mariners, whose first season was in 1970, struggled to find success, but had a promising group of young players by the early 90s. One of those players exhibited the style and substance of the 90s culture in almost every way. He was seen as the Michael Jordan of baseball, something even Michael Jordan himself could not live up to. With a backwards hat and a swing so sweet he was dubbed Swingman, Ken Griffey Jr. was the biggest thing in all of baseball. His athletic home run saving catches and cool demeanor made him the favorite player of kids across the country. So, it was a perfect match when Nintendo signed Griffey Jr. to be on the cover of their brand new baseball game for their 16-bit Super Nintendo console. Ken Griffey Jr. Presents Major League Baseball arrived on the Super Nintendo in spring of 1994 and would have the opposite licensing situation as Tony La Russa Baseball, sporting the MLB teams but having only one licensed player, being Griffey Jr. himself. Nintendo even sold a home run Super Nintendo bundle, which featured the NES console and a copy of the game. Although reviews of the game were mixed, the funky music combined with the colorful and cartoony graphics were a hit. Ken Griffey Jr. Presents sold over a million copies and showed EA the potential of baseball on the Super Nintendo. EA released MLBPA Baseball 95 on the system in 1995. The game was developed by Visual Concepts, who are still in business today, most notably being the team behind the NBA 2K franchise. MLBPA 95 was met with mixed reception. It was time for EA to regroup and shoot some new life into their baseball offerings. With gaming consoles that would tout 3D graphics on the horizon, EA was determined to cement their name as THE sports game leader. Chapter 3. It's in the Marketing Looking to ditch the generic names such as MLBPA Baseball, EA rebranded the series as Triple Play. The first game in the new series was made by game studio Extended Play, which would later be merged with other studios to create EA Canada, a studio that is still active as of the making of this documentary. It would be the last in the series that would be exclusive to the Genesis console. Triple Play 97 started the foray into 3D polygonal graphics, and EA would never look back. EA would also begin to feature cover athletes, going from coaches to players to better connect with consumers. All-time great and Mr. Padre himself, Tony Gwynn, would grace the cover for 97. These early games were largely experimental. 
Getting 3D models and animations up and going was risky, as seen with EA's cancellation of the PlayStation version of Madden NFL 96, which was under development by Visual Concepts. Building these games for new architecture mostly came at the expense of other features, modes, and AI programming. It was somewhat of a resetting for the genre, which allowed for other competitors to get in on the 3D ground floor. Sony, who entered the console market with their own CD-based system called the PlayStation after a deal with Nintendo went bad, had some experience publishing baseball games up to this point. Sony ImageSoft published ESPN Baseball Tonight for the Super Nintendo, but that was met with a mostly negative response. Sony ImageSoft merged with Sony Computer Entertainment of America to form Sony Interactive Studios America, or SISA for short. SISA developed many key games early in the PlayStation's life, including games like Too Extreme, Jet Moto, and Twisted Metal 2. Among these early titles, SISA would release MLB Pennant Race, which many reviewers praised for its graphics, but chastised for its slow gameplay. While the stadiums in Pennant Race were polygonal, the players were not, and the game took longer than expected to be released which made for a disconnect with the stats in the game and what was going on in the real world. SISA would change their name to 989 Studios and even branch out into a sports division known as 989 Sports. EA, Sony, Sega, and a slew of medium-sized publishers like Acclaim and Interplay were all competing to secure a fan base for years to come. Even Trip Hawkins, who had left EA to start a new video game company known as 3DO, had jumped back into the market with a game called High Heat Baseball. High Heat was praised for its fundamentals, often being called the best playing baseball sim on the market, but struggled in the graphics and marketing department. Sammy Sosa High Heat Baseball 2001, catch it! It's so real! And catch Sammy Sosa Softball Slam! But as things started to shift into a new decade, Baseball's popularity, which had taken a huge hit from a cancelled season due to bargaining disputes in 1994, was starting to trend upwards. During the 1998 season, Cardinals first baseman Mark McGuire and Cubs outfielder Sammy Sosa were locked in a home run battle for the ages. Both men would end up breaking Yankee great Roger Maris's record of 61 home runs set in 1961, but it would be McGuire that would come out on top with a total of 70. Every day, America would talk about the home run totals for Sosa versus McGuire and speculate about how much the totals would increase by the end of the day. There's a certain number of us who see this as a way to uh, be part of history, and I think that's exciting for people. The Home Run Derby, a part of the All-Star festivities in July, was the favorite event among young baseball fans alike. Nike's marketing team was even in on the home run fun. Hi, Tom. Chicks dig the long ball. Hey, have you guys seen Mark? I've seen Mark. None of this was lost on Electronic Arts. The triple play game started to veer more into spectacle making a bigger deal out of home runs with exaggerated sounds and offering mini-games where the player would try to hit home run targets for points. For Triple Play 99, EA, much like Nintendo did five years prior, signed a young Mariners player who was gaining traction as the future of baseball. Drafted number one overall by Seattle in the 1993 MLB Draft, Alex Rodriguez became the starting shortstop for the Mariners by the 1996 season. While not having the same transcendence as Ken Griffey Jr., Rodriguez's combination of good swing power, defense, and speed undoubtedly made him an exciting player to watch. EA had just signed young golf phenom Tiger Woods to be the cover athlete of their golf series, and their push for the cyber athlete was well underway. Guys like, whoa, guys like me don't get much respect. I mean, I hit big. But there's no dealer or commercial. I make huge plays. I'm not even a cereal box. But man, I could care less. <laughs> Triple Play 99. You've never seen baseball like this. Whoa. 
EA's marketing machine was hitting full speed during the early 2000s, particularly EA Sports, which had not only become a household name, but had become part of the mainstream culture. EA knew that even if you had a great playing video game, getting people through the door was key, and they knew just how to do it. Regardless of game quality, the EA Sports brand name had tremendous value. Triple Play 2000 featured Sammy Sosa on the cover, capitalizing off one of the biggest baseball seasons ever. During this time, Nintendo tried to replicate their success of Ken Griffey Jr. Presents with Ken Griffey Jr.'s winning run. This time developed by Studio Rare, who were known for their work on the Donkey Kong Country series, but the game lacked a lot of the vibrant colors and energetic music of the previous game. Nintendo would try again with Major League Baseball featuring Ken Griffey Jr. for the N64, which was a solid game, but would be one of Nintendo's last ventures into publishing licensed sports games for some time. Just as Triple Play was settling into its identity, it was time for video games to make another leap forward. Sony was about to launch their brand new PlayStation 2 hardware, and EA was ready to show off what they could do graphically. Triple Play 2001 released in March of 2000, featuring New York Mets catcher Mike Piazza on the cover. But with the PS2 due to be out in October of that year, EA decided to drop the year from the title with their debut on Sony's new console. Triple Play Baseball released in February of 2001 for both the PlayStation and PlayStation 2 platforms. The game featured Oakland Athletics first baseman Jason Giambi as the cover athlete. The visuals were a stunning leap forward from the crude and jagged polygons of the PS1. Reflections could be seen off player helmets, and detailed city backdrops resided beyond the park fences. Logos could be clearly seen on jerseys and caps, and players' faces were recognizable for the first time. Graphically speaking, Triple Play Baseball was impressive. But the gameplay could have used the same level of polish, as it was notably stiffer than its PS1 predecessor. Game modes would leave a lot to be desired. Treyarch would hand over development to Pandemic Studios for 2002, while EA Corporate planned another rebranding of the series. Chapter 4 The Rise of MVP As EA Sports found their footing with the new power of the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube consoles, other publishers used the opportunity to take a stab at the baseball genre. The saturation of the genre was at an all-time high. A select few consumers would be dedicated enough to buy multiple baseball titles, perhaps even a few who would buy them all. But for the majority, they'd choose one series and stick with it. As the boom of the internet brought reviews and impressions of games to the forefront, winning fans over would take a little more than marketing and graphics. EA Vancouver aimed to make their next entry more involving for the player. To do this, the team added metered pitching and defensive controls, meaning that players had to pay close attention to every throw that was made. Whilst hitting, players were able to influence what type of hit they were going for and which direction the ball would end up. This visual feedback initiative was just the tip of the iceberg for what the MVP series would become popular for. Franchise mode, although fairly simplistic, tasked players with a list of contextual goals to achieve during a 10-year span. For the cover that year, EA would sign not one, but two athletes. Diamondbacks pitcher Randy Johnson and athletic shortstop Miguel Tejada would share the cover, as both men had won the MVP trophy in their respective leagues the year prior. The changes in gameplay and the boost in presentation helped excite the baseball crowd, and luckily for consumers, there was more good to come. MVP 2004 kept the momentum rolling signing young Cardinal slugger Albert Pujols to grace the cover, while also celebrating baseball's storied heritage by including several vintage teams and ballparks. Franchise mode was changed to Dynasty mode, and while it looks similar, it added a slew of new features to enrich the experience. Through 120 seasons, players were now challenged to shorter contract goals. Managing AA and AAA rosters with call-ups and send-downs, player suspensions, which can happen as a result of charging the mound after being hit by a pitch, and a new player morale system. Players would have a face next to their name, indicating their attitude towards you and the organization. This added a huge layer to player management, 
as having an upset player could affect the attitudes of every other player on your team. Moods would be affected by contract salaries, playing time and position, and how well they're playing during the season. Users would have to balance their roster appropriately and cut or trade players that were impossible to please. Outside of Dynasty mode, players could compete in home run and pitching showdowns, which would award points for certain achievements during a timed event. EA Vancouver was aiming to make MVP the total baseball package, and what's more, the best was yet to come. During this time in the mid-2000s, other baseball series were dropping like flies. 3DO released the final entry of High Heat Baseball, just before the company itself went bankrupt in 2003. Microsoft reportedly bought the rights to High Heat Baseball, but hasn't done anything with the series to this point. Midway's attempt at bringing baseball into the Blitz realm with MLB Slugfest was short-lived. All-Star Baseball, the series based on simulation and realism, with slow, methodical gameplay and impressive graphics, was on the brink of sinking along with its publisher, Acclaim. Even Microsoft's baseball game, Inside Pitch, which offered roster updates and 1v1 online games via Xbox Live, only lasted a single year in 2003. The three contenders in the baseball ring were 2K's World Series Baseball, Sony's MLB Series, and MVP from EA. Each of these titles played differently, all having their strong suits and weaknesses. World Series Baseball sported the ESPN license, which brought with it unmatched presentation. The MLB series offered a PS2 exclusive that was trying to hold steady with solid gameplay from its PS1 emergence. But of the three, MVP was the most popular. That designation would only strengthen the next entry, MVP Baseball 2005. Soundtracks in video games these days don't seem like much of a big deal. With utilities like YouTube and Spotify being accessible through our phones and laptops, it's simple to just mute the in-game music and play whatever you'd like. You can even run these digital music platforms on your console while you play your games. However, back in the mid-2000s, game soundtracks were big business. You'd get a handful of songs that you were going to hear hundreds, if not thousands of times, and curating the list not only shaped the mood for the game, but it also launched the careers of musical unknowns. During this era, the MVP series, and EA in general, was usually great at this aspect. While the NBA Live series was heavily drenched in hip-hop music, and the Madden series weaved hip-hop with rock, the MVP series went for a softer sound, primarily going with alternative rock. The slow game of baseball lent itself to more easy-sounding songs, which meant you were going to get a nice variety from what the other sports games played in their menus. It also helped that this era was a big time for alternative rock music in general. While the whole soundtrack is widely celebrated among fans, the song Tessie by the Dropkick Murphys, a song that was made in tribute to another song that was believed to help the Boston Americans win the first World Series in 1903, perfectly sets the tone for MVP 2005. The season prior, the Red Sox had snapped the curse of the Bambino and won their first World Series since 1918, defeating the St. Louis Cardinals. MVP 2005 took what was already a good game in 2004 and continued to make the game both more accessible and more customizable, showing that you can service both the hardcore and casual crowds in the same year. To make hitting easier, users would now see a color on the pitch that would indicate the pitch type allowing the player to identify the movement on the pitch, as graphics of the time were not of high enough fidelity to tell on its own. New pitching and hitting minigames were added that made learning the fundamentals of each skill fun. With the hitting minigame, the user would be given a points total, with ramps and targets on the field to hit. For the pitching minigame, users are given a strike zone with colored panels, indicating which pitches they need to use to hit each target, in order to break the light-colored blocks. But a feature that showed the innovative push that was commonplace for EA Sports games of the time was the brand new ballpark creation tool. While options were limited, the feature coincided with the new owner mode, where users earned money selling tickets and concessions to spend on players and ballpark upgrades. Even the menu designs hold up as some of the coolest UI ever seen in a sports game. MVP 2005 was well received by both critics and fans, and sold extremely well even becoming part of the PS2's Greatest Hits lineup. 
Baseball fans were excited to see where the series would go next. But later that year, a watershed moment would take place that would change sports video games forever. Chapter 5 Two Years of College When Electronic Arts and the NFL announced their exclusive partnership, which made EA the sole publisher of simulation-based NFL video games, it made many consumers upset and gave those who were already sour on Madden a bleak outlook on the future of video game football. But there wasn't a clear indication on the deal's impact for other sports games. It wouldn't be long before 2K would retaliate by signing a similar, multi-platform exclusive deal with Major League Baseball. While the deal would leave the door open for Sony to continue publishing their MLB game for their own platform, this meant the end for MVP Baseball as we knew it. With the code in their back pocket, and the development team at the ready, EA looked for a way to continue their baseball efforts without the MLB and MLBPA licensing. They would look to the college ranks. For the 2006 season, MVP Baseball was released as MVP 06 NCAA Baseball, featuring 2005 College World Series MVP David Morrall from the University of Texas. EA had success with their college football game, and while they knew a college baseball game wouldn't reach the same popularity, they were hoping to at least turn a profit. MVP 06 took most of what was in the previous MLB version and gave it a college flair. Create a ballpark mixed well with the new game's create a school feature and lack of official ballparks. In Dynasty mode, users would now have to deal with recruiting and short-term rosters. Meanwhile, MLB 2K6, which was being developed by Cush Games, had made the jump to the then new Xbox 360 platform, and a rocky jump it was. Unfortunately, this was not uncommon for sports games and their move to the next-gen consoles. Sales for MVP 06 reportedly saw a drop of over 1 million units sold for both the PS2 and Xbox combined, compared to MVP 2005. While this was still impressive when considering transitioning to college branding, EA had dropped the initial MSRP of the game to $30 in order to compete with the other baseball games on the market. With Xbox gamers making a transition of their own to the 360, EA decided to dump the Xbox version of the next entry in the series. MVP 07 NCAA Baseball, released in February of 2007 for the PS2. The game featured former first round pick Jared Weaver, who had made his MLB debut the previous season with the Angels, finishing 5th in the Rookie of the Year voting. While sales numbers aren't available for MVP 07, EA's decision to cancel the series thereafter would indicate that the sales weren't good enough to develop the series forward to the 360 and PS3 platforms. While 2K did try to get the most out of their MLB partnership, releasing alternative licensed games like MLB Power Pros and The Vigs, their main MLB series was panned by both critics and consumers alike. After desperate ploys by 2K failed, such as their initiative to give away $1 million to the person who could pitch the first perfect game upon release, plus their recruitment of supermodel Kate Upton, the series was eventually cancelled after the 2013 entry. Each year, the game received minimal updates, and severe bugs went without a fix, leading many to believe that 2K had just given up on the series and was waiting for their deal with MLB to expire. With EA long gone from the baseball scene, and with soft competition from 2K, Sony's baseball series, which had been renamed MLB The Show, was able to rise as the top baseball simulation game in North America. While the game could only be made and sold on Sony platforms, such as the PS3, PS4, PSP, and the Vita, many fans bought a Sony console just to play the show. The series had become an important exclusive for Sony. Over the years since MVP was cancelled, there's been much speculation and clamoring for a return. With seemingly no contract obstructions in the way, the hesitation seems to be in whether or not EA would get the return on investment they'd need to justify putting the game back in development. There have been rumors that EA strongly considers bringing back the series every year, but nothing has actually been shown. Is the market strong enough to support multiple baseball simulations? Is baseball healthy enough to warrant it? These are questions that many have wondered. And until the day we finally hear the announcement of its return, 
many will hold on to the great time spent and fond memories had with MVP.